Bonjour and welcome back to my world history course. Last time we covered warfare in the Eastern Mediterranean, specifically the wars between Greece and Persia. Today we'll head to the Western Mediterranean and cover the granddaddy of all these ancient civilizations, Rome. And I've said it often, world history is a huge topic. The Roman Empire spanned a thousand years, so there's enough material to spend a whole semester on this topic alone. So, as is my wont, I will just give you a general primer on Roman history to set the stage, and then zero in on one issue that I find particularly interesting, which today will be slavery. Let's start with the origins of Rome. According to Roman mythology, the city was founded in 753 BC. And you probably have heard the story, it involved twin babies, Remus and Romulus, who were nursed by a she-wolf and then had a falling out. And I have some doubts whether a she-wolf would nurse human babies, but that's a story that Romans like to tell. The scene that became a symbol of their city, and that can still be found on football jerseys, for example, all the way to the present time. As historians would like to tell other stories, which are less pretty, but probably more accurate. Archaeologists have found remnants of a village in the location of Rome, going back to the 8th century BC, so that roughly matches the legend. And there are reasons why the city was founded there, beyond the legend of Remus and Romulus. Rome was alongside a river, as always, for our ancient civilizations. The Tiber River itself is not very big, it's not the Nile, the Tigris, uh, but at that point where Rome was founded, there was a ford, a place to cross the river, and so it was a natural spot for merchants to converge. There were also seven hills in the area, which provided early Romans with spots that they could fortify and also an important item of trade, and that would be salt, which was a key staple in ancient times because that was used to preserve food long before the invention of canning or freezing. In fact, salt was so commonplace that it was often used as a currency. Soldiers in Rome would be paid with a salarium, a bunch of salt, and that has given us the word salary, a wage. So initially, Rome was ruled by kings from the time of Remus and Romulus forward, and that period is known as the monarchy. And it is shrouded in mystery because it goes so far back. What we do know is that in 509 BC, the Romans overthrew the kings and set up a republic, a government without kings, which lasted until 31 BC. The republic is a much better known period uh, than the monarchy because this is when Rome conquered most of its neighbors. Initially, Rome was no more than just a small town and the region around it, which is called uh, the Latium. Uh, it has given us the term Latin for the language. And there were more advanced civilizations elsewhere in Italy, such as the Etruscans uh, to the north, or even going further north uh, in uh, France, uh, the Gauls, who were so powerful that they were even able uh, once to raid Rome. The people of Rome were not particularly civilized, they're not like ancient Athens. Uh, in fact, they had a reputation for being rough and violent. A uh, famous war began when they abducted and raped uh, the women of their neighbors, the Sabines. And the Romans were pretty proud of telling that story, uh, because they saw themselves as a warlike people, rough, cruel even, but practical, loyal to the state and courageous. And if that meant abusing, abducting, and raping their neighbors, so be it, according to the Romans. Another anecdote that said a lot about the Roman mindset involved Cincinnatus. Uh, he was a Roman farmer who lived at a time when Rome was threatened uh, by a local rival. So in times of peril like this, Rome would set aside its republican form of government and then appoint a dictator, a man who had absolute powers for six months, uh, long enough to solve the military crisis. Well, Cincinnatus left his farm, he took over the army of Rome, and defeated the enemy in just two weeks. And then, rather than rule as a dictator for a few more months, he resigned his command and went back to his farm. And Romans like to tell that tale because it showcased all the moral virtues that they liked. Here was a simple man willing to put the needs of the state above his own. Uh, Cincinnatus was later an inspiration for George Washington, who also resigned his command after the American Revolution, rather than being a king of the US. Uh, Cincinnati, Ohio is named after him. So by the 300s BC, Rome was in control of most of Italy. Their main rival by that point was a city that we've mentioned before, and that would be Carthage. And if you remember, Carthage had begun as a Phoenician settlement in today's Tunisia. We don't know that much about Carthage in large part because 
spoiler alert, uh, history is written by the winners and the Romans who are the winners of that rivalry with Carthage. What we know them uh, mostly is through outside sources, Roman, Greek, and these are quite biased. Apparently, the Carthaginians worshipped a god called Baal, who occasionally demanded child sacrifices. And the Romans found that very cruel. The Romans were also known to kill their own kids uh, as a form of birth control, and they practiced human sacrifice on occasion. The Carthaginians also crucified generals who had disgraced themselves in battle. That was cruel, said the Romans, who then proceeded to borrow this very form of torture and use it on a large scale against slaves and rebels. What we do know is that the Carthaginians were rich. Uh, Carthage was home to two bustling ports, one that they used for warships and one for merchant ships. And that money allowed them to hire mercenaries for their army, and that also the Romans found ridiculous. Roman citizens were expected to fight their own wars, so they always criticized the Carthaginians for being weak and effeminate. Whatever the Carthaginians did, it worked. By the 300 BC, uh, Carthage was a notable power that controlled much of North Africa, as well as the islands of Sicily and Sardinia. And if you look at the map, obviously that would put them on a collision course with Rome. And Roman Carthage fought three main wars together, known as the Punic Wars. The first was found around 250 BC over the island of Sicily, uh, which, again, if you look at the map, stood at the juncture of the two growing empires. Just one problem, the war was fought over an island, Sicily, and the Romans had basically no navy. But they figured, we're practical people, we're good engineers, how hard can it be to be a sailor? Uh, so they built a navy from scratch, faced the experienced Carthaginian sailors at sea, and they lost. So they built another navy, and they lost again, and on, and on, and on. We often remember Romans as great soldiers, but their history was littered with a litany of defeats. What they had was tenacity. They kept going on and on, and the one battle that they always won was the last battle of the war. So the Romans, in that case, eventually designed a corvus, uh, which is a Roman term for a giant hook attached to their trireme. So instead of fighting a standard sea battle, they would use a corvus, uh, which looks like a crow, uh, to hook the enemy trireme, and then their legionaries could board the enemy ship, and transforming that naval battle into a land battle for which well, the Romans were better suited. So eventually the Romans gained ascendancy at sea, they blockaded the coast of Carthage, and forced their enemy to sue for peace when they were broke. And that's how the first Punic War ended with Roman victory. And Romans got Sicily, and later Sardinia as a result. To make things worse, Carthage was so broke after the war uh, that they could not pay their mercenaries, and so they faced a major mercenary uprising on their own soil, uh, which was particularly cruel. Carthage eventually recovered economically, though, and especially when it took over Spain as a new settlement. And there it exploded large silver mines, uh, which financed a new army of missionaries. And so Carthage was on the rise again, and its Second Punic War began. That's the most famous of the three because it involved Hannibal, who is usually cited as one of the three great military leaders of ancient times, alongside Alexander the Great and Julius Caesar. So rather than wait for the Romans to attack, Hannibal uh, went on the offensive, and he walked all the way from Spain through southern France and then into Italy itself, and famously he crossed the Alp Mountains uh, with an army of elephants. And the Romans faced Hannibal uh, many times on the battlefield, and they lost just about as many times, especially at a great famous battle called the Battle of Cannae. But you know one thing about the Romans, they never quit. One of their generals, Fabius, decided to avoid major battles with Hannibal because he kept losing them, and instead he ran away from him. And that kind of slow, indecisive strategy to kind of outlast your enemy, that has been called Fabian ever since, after Fabius. And there was even a group of moderate socialists in early 20th century Britain who called themselves uh, Fabians in his honor. Well, Fabius bought enough time for the other Romans to send yet another army, this time straight to Carthage itself. And that army forced Carthage to sue for peace, even though Hannibal himself had never been defeated in Italy per se. And so that was a second Roman victory. The third Punic War was fought around 150 BC. Uh, Carthage, even though it had lost Spain after uh, the Second Punic War, well, it had recovered again economically, and so there was a Roman senator, Cato, who was afraid that Carthage might be a threat again. 
So anytime Cato would do a speech in the Senate in Rome on whatever the topic was, whether it's taxes or education or sewage, whatever, he would end by saying, Delanda est Cartago, which in Latin means, by the way, Carthage must be destroyed. And his fellow senators eventually agreed, if anything, just to shut him up, and so Rome attacked Carthage. And the third and last Punic War was more of a one-sided affair uh, that ended with a Roman takeover that was brutal, even by their standards. Uh, they killed most of the population of Carthage, they enslaved the rest, they razed the city to the ground, and then, as if that was not enough, they sowed salt into the surrounding fields to make them sterile. And then, finally, they left Carthage. I remember visiting Tunisia as a child, and I was already a history buff uh, back then, so I was very excited to visit the ruins of the great city of Carthage, only to realize that only a few stones remain from that period of history. I was very disappointed until I remembered, oh yeah, the Romans won. So by the first century BC, Rome had defeated every potential rival, not just Carthage, but Greece and Gaul, which is France today, as well. And victory brought its share of troubles, however. Uh, Rome was no longer a monarchy, it was a republic back then, but it was not an egalitarian democracy either. Average Roman citizens, who were called the plebeians, uh, they could vote, but the system was designed so that the rich folk, the patricians, the nobility, they exercised most of the power. So it was more of an oligarchy, if you will. And inequality only worsened after the many wars of conquest. A general like Julius Caesar came back from Gaul with an immense fortune in slaves and loot. Meanwhile, his soldiers got a pittance and they struggled to readjust to civilian life. In fact, there were so many slaves in uh, Rome that free Romans, they struggled to find a job because how could they compete against people, the slaves, who were paid nothing? And that led to endless popular turmoil in the streets and then ambitious generals like Caesar fought each other in a series of civil wars. I won't get into the details, I'll just refer you to the HBO series Rome, which did a masterful job of recreating the politics of late Republican Rome. And I also recommend the book SPQR by Mary Beard, which is also really insightful when it comes to the political culture of ancient Rome. The man who emerged victorious from this power struggle was not Caesar, who was uh, assassinated, but a relative of his, Octavian, also known as Augustus the Great. By 31 BC, he ditched most of the old Republican practices and became, for all intents and purposes, Emperor of Rome. And that began the last period of Roman history, uh, which lasted until 476 AD. The first uh, two centuries of the Christian era were the apex of the Roman Empire. Uh, they had defeated all their enemies, so aside from occasional revolts, like say the Jewish revolt in 70 AD, the empire was generally at peace. And that was called the Pax Romana, the Peace of Rome in Latin. So from Britain and the Danube in the north, all the way to the edge of Persia in the east, to the Sahara Desert in the south, uh, to the Atlantic in the west, you had an empire of 100 million people uh, that endured for centuries, which was highly unusual in world history. And that allowed Octavian and his successors, the other emperors, to focus on architecture rather than war. And the Romans were great engineers, not just great soldiers. Uh, they may not have invented philosophy, they relied on the Greeks for that, but they invented mortar, uh, cement, and that's useful too. So they would bring water from far away using massive aqueducts, like the one uh, that you see on the photo here in the Pont du Gard in southern France, and all that so that uh, cities would have plenty of water. And then in those cities they built public baths, like the massive baths of Caracalla in Rome. They also built temples to the gods, like the Pantheon in Rome, and giant stadiums for chariot races, like the Circus Maximus in Rome, uh, that could accommodate something like 300,000 spectators. It doesn't exist anymore. And then they built theaters to stage plays and great arenas like the Colosseum in Rome to stage gladiator fights. And I focused on the buildings in Rome, but if you travel all around the Mediterranean Sea today, you'll find plenty of Roman monuments in Morocco, uh, Germany, France, Turkey, or like this example, uh, in Libya. In fact, many of them are in better shape than the Roman Forum itself since, spoiler alert again, uh, the Roman Empire eventually fell and Rome was stacked by barbarians. And then all these great monuments were connected by an immense network of roads, some of which are still in use today. I could go on and on. Uh, many of the languages of Europe, like French, they are Romance languages derived from Latin. 
many legal codes, like right here in Louisiana, they're based on the Nipponi Code, which itself was based on the Roman legal code. The largest religion in the world, Christianity, that emerged in the Roman Empire, we'll study it next time. So to quote the old Monty Python joke, uh, what did the Romans ever do to us? Uh, well, nothing except clean water, roads, education, law and order, and peace. These were notable achievements. But I don't want to idealize Rome too much because that empire came into being through war, remained in existence through targeted acts of terror, and it based its economy on enslaved labor. Uh, when you speak of the great celebrated Julius Caesar, well, he invaded my home country, Gaul, or France. He killed one million people there, enslaved another million out of a population of maybe seven million French people at the time. So let's shift to slavery for the rest of the lecture because that was a big part of the Roman Empire as well. When Americans think of slavery, they think of cotton pickers in Alabama or Louisiana around 1850. Well, Roman slavery shared some similarities with the American system, but also major differences with antebellum Louisiana. For one thing, most Roman slaves were not black. Uh, some were, but not all. And many were not employed in the fields and plantations. So how did you become a slave exactly? Well, there were a lot of ways. Uh, natural reproduction was one, obviously. Under Roman law, slavery was matrilineal, which is a fancy way of saying that children of female slaves would be enslaved themselves. So theoretically, the slave population could have become self-sustaining in time uh, if you had enough natural birth, except uh, it wasn't. Uh, life expectancy was already low for Romans, but especially bad for slaves because of the way they were treated. So enslaved women could never produce enough children to maintain the slave population over time. Another way to expand the slave population, uh, that would be war. As Romans conquered Carthage and Gaul, and Britain, uh, they captured countless POWs and then they would enslave them. Even during the Pax Romana, when uh, there was relative peace, there would still be skirmishes along the border with Scotland or Germany, and that brought a trickle of enslaved captives. And then there were internal revolts like in Judea in 70 AD. And then, beyond that, Romans also purchased slaves from outside the realm of the empire or from pirates. Also, a free person could become a slave by legal means. Uh, one could be enslaved as punishment for a crime, for example, and then sent uh, to the galleys or to a mine. Also, under Roman law, uh, the pater familias, who was the father of the family, he had extensive rights over his family, and that included the right to sell his own children as slaves if times got tough and he could not feed all of his offspring. Romans were also known to abandon their infants at birth in a crude form of birth control, especially if that child was female. Uh, here's a letter from a husband to his pregnant wife dated 1 BC. I think she was from Egypt. If you do give birth, if it is male, let it live, said the husband. If it is female, if it's a girl, cast it out on the dung pile, end quote. So slave traders would then rescue these infants who had been left to die of exposure and then sell them as slaves when they grew up. So in other words, there were many ways that you could become a slave in ancient Rome and many ways that slaves could be employed uh, as well. Uh, some would be employed on large farms, just like in the antebellum south. Uh, because there was no national debt in Rome or stock market per se, uh, the easiest way for a rich man to invest his money uh, would not be to invest in the stock market. Instead, you would buy land and slaves, and then profit off the crops. And these large farms were called latifundia in Latin. Uh, but slaves were employed in a bewildering number of ways as well. Uh, they rode on the triremes, the galleys of the navy. Uh, they mined salt and gold. They built monuments. They served as cooks, maids in every rich household. And some even held pretty high level positions like tutor, accountant, foreman, uh, or engineer. And Roman law uh, condoned slavery, it made it legal. Uh, that law contained some provisions for the well-being of the slaves or even their manumission, which means their freedom. So if they were freed, uh, freedmen would then wear a special hat called a liberty cap so that you could tell them apart from regular free people. And that has remained a symbol of freedom ever since. Uh, notice how people in the French Revolution, for example, they wore a liberty cap when they got rid of their king uh, in the 1790s. You will also find that symbol in the iconography of 18th century Haiti, uh, which made sense because there was a major slave revolt there. 
And you'll find that symbol uh, during the American Revolution uh, as well. And it's still on the seal of the Department of the Army, I think. But Roman law uh, could also be quite cruel to slaves. Uh, for example, inflicting the old Carthaginian torture of crucifixion for those uh, who dare to escape to find their liberty. But let's not be too focused on the letter of Roman law. I study slavery in a different context, in Haiti, and what I have found is that the reality of slavery is often more twisted than what the law says. So you have to dig deeper than just the letter of the law. According to a story told by Tacitus, uh, there was one first century Roman senator who was once killed by his own slave. Apparently both the master and the slave had loved the same enslaved boy, and so this was a crime of passion. As you can expect, sadly, the murderer was crucified, but also all 400 slaves in the household. Their crime, if you can call it that way, uh, was that they had not done enough to protect their master. And that story really shows you how slavery involved many forms of exploitation, including sexual exploitation of that young slave boy, and how that form of uh, employment relied on widespread terror to endure, whatever the law said. Let's zero in even further on one particular group of slaves, and that would be the gladiators. And I'm sure you've heard of them. Uh, they were the subject of a popular movie a few years back with Russell Crowe. What you may not know is that gladiators were slaves too. So where did the Romans get the sick idea of getting slaves to fight each other to the death? Well, the practice began as a religious ceremony, a munus, as it was called, M-U-N-U-S. Sometime in the 3rd century BC, a Roman aristocrat forced three pairs of slaves to fight right in the middle of a cemetery as a way to honor his father, as if this kind of human sacrifice uh, could help his dad enjoy eternal life. And the practice spread, and that became so popular that crowds would flock to cemeteries just for the entertainment value. And so those bouts had to be moved to custom-made arenas, eventually uh, like the Coliseum. And even there, however, uh, the fights always remained technically religious. They began with a ceremony to honor the God of the dead, and for that reason Christians could not attend the gladiator games, not because these were gruesome, uh, be because they were pagan rituals. So obviously the practice spread also not because of the religious value, but also because it was popular. Uh, the goal of the games was to entertain. But then, at third, uh, there was always a strong political undertone. As I mentioned before, in the late Republican era, Rome was racked by civil wars because there were so many unemployed people. Uh, so the state responded by distributing free bread to the poor uh, who had no jobs, and then staging entertainment to keep them busy. That policy was called Panem et Kirkenses, bread and games. Keep the populace fat and entertained so that they don't complain. Or as we'd say today, give them Doritos and football. That'll shut them up. So it is in Rome also the game, also saw the games as a kind of political theater. Bringing Pudamuus to Rome and then forcing them to fight for the pleasure of the crowd, that was a way to reenact past battles and show the triumph of Rome over its enemies. And the gruesome spectacle also sent a message to others. Romans, they were the kind of people who brought their kids to the Colosseum to watch people die. Don't mess with us. That was a message. So most of these gladiators would begin as criminals or piodamuius, uh, but there were enough desperate men in Rome, and then the aura of the gladiators was so great uh, that it happened that some free men would voluntarily enslave themselves so that they would be gladiators. Sure, you had to fight several times a year and risk being killed, but life was tough anyway, and as a gladiator, the women loved you. There were even two emperors, Caligula and Commodus, uh, who went into the arena to fight as gladiators, though one assumes in their case that the bouts were rigged. Organizing game? That was a complex and expensive affair. Uh, slaves had to be bought and then trained, and that was the job of entrepreneurs that were called the Lanistas. Uh, they owned schools in Capua, south of Rome, where they would train the gladiators. Then they would sell or rent the talent to anyone wanting to pay for a show. So then essentially the Hellenistas had a private army of their own, and for that reason their schools were eventually taken over by the state under the empire, just for security reasons. Romans put a lot of thought into selecting the armament of gladiators, too little armor, and the outcome would be some brief bloodbath. Too much, however, and the fight would be one that would go on just forever. So different types of gladiators emerge over time to allow for interesting matchups. 
uh, the Thracians, who often were recruited among Jews and Greeks in the eastern part of the empire, uh, they fought with a short dagger and a small round shield. They had little armor, uh, but they were swift. Then you had the Retiari, who were often of African origin, and they fought with a trident and a net, like a fisherman. And then the Mormeos, who were often from Germany, or Gaul, in northwestern Europe, they fought with a bigger sword and shield. They were better protected, uh, but also slower. And then the winner, whoever that was, he would receive prize money and possibly freedom. The loser, well, might be spared or finished off, depending on the winds of the populace. The Romans devised variations on the same theme, uh, but always with the goal of getting rid of criminals and POWs in some kind of entertaining fashion. So they brought exotic animals from all over the empire at great cost, including bears, elephants, rhinos, and then they would stage extensive hunts called venatios, which I think is where we get the word venison from today. Or they would use those wild animals to devour victims. It was called ad bestias. And that was considered a humiliating way to die, and that was often inflicted on Christian martyrs uh, during the era of persecutions. In rare cases, engineers would flood the entire arena with water and stage a mock naval battle where hundreds of slaves reenacted the Battle of Salamis or Actium or whatever. Uh, these Nomachians, as they were called, uh, they were particularly rare and expensive to stage. As a historian, my job is to retrace the past in a neutral fashion, without passing moral judgment. And that can be hard when dealing with Romans, because they tied people to a pole and then they unleashed lions at them. But then we're not completely past that stage. Uh, we still like to reenact civil war battles, albeit without bloodshed. Uh, we like to stage symbolic wars between countries, or we call that the Olympics today. And people do enjoy watching people maul or even kill each other, uh, whether it's an American football or ultimate fighting championships. So maybe we're not that civilized after all. But anyway, let's get back to slavery. So if Romans treated slaves so poorly, how could the slaves fight back then? The proper form of resistance, that's a question that slaves have faced since times immemorial. So running away, that was always an option, especially if you live far away from Rome itself. Suicide would have been another option. Uh, it might seem self-defeating, but as a slave, your body belongs to somebody else, so suicide is like sabotage, destroying your master's property. And there were several stories of gladiators who, for example, strangled each other right before a fight in order to deny the crowd the pleasure of watching them die. Revolt was the most extreme form of resistance and also the rarest. Uh, we know of three large revolts, one around 130 BC, one around 100 BC, and one around 70 BC. And notice how they all took place in the late Republican era when there was a large influx of slaves and how they also took place 30 years apart from one another as if each new generation of enslaved people uh, had to be taught a lesson by Rome. Also, uh, these revolts took place in southern Italy and Sicily, uh, which makes sense because this is where many rich Romans uh, had acquired large absentee estates, the Latin Funia, uh, so absentee capitalism uh, that might also have been a causal factor. The most famous of these revolts was the third one, the Spartacus slave revolt in 73 to 71 BC. We know a little about Spartacus himself, he was just a slave and history is written by winners. Uh, but apparently he was a prisoner of war of Greek ancestry uh, who ended up in a gladiator training school in Capua. One day, he and 70 other gladiators seized kitchen utensils and they revolted. And they fled to Mount Vesuvius, uh, the big volcano near Naples. There, they began to attract more and more followers until Spartacus was at the head of a group of several dozen thousand runaway slaves. The Romans, as a result, sent some forces against Spartacus and his army, uh, but those forces were defeated one after the other, in part because Romans looked down upon slaves and they didn't take the necessary precautions. But as you know, the Romans never quit and they kept sending more armies. So Spartacus tried to leave the Italian peninsula by going north, through the Alps and then hiring pirate ships to escape Thaos across the sea, uh, but his hopes came to naught. He was trapped in Italy. The Romans eventually appointed the richest man in Rome, Crassus, to finish off Spartacus. Crassus began by decimating his own troops. Decimating means that when Roman generals thought that their men had been guilty of cowardice, they would select one out of ten at random, deci that means one tenth, 
and then kill them in full view of the other members of the army, which was quite cruel, but apparently boosted the army's willingness to fight. So because he was trapped in Italy by the army of Crassus, Spartacus decided to fight one big battle against Crassus, which unfortunately he lost. Spartacus apparently died in that battle, but 6,000 of his followers uh, were taken alive and crucified one by one, all the way from the battle site in southern Italy to the gates of Rome, as a grim warning against all the slaves. So Spartacus was defeated for good, in fact, that was the last major slave revolt in Roman history, but he achieved more fame in death than Crassus ever did. He became a hero to many. I studied the Haitian Revolution in the 18th century, and the main figure that I studied, Toussaint Louverture, he called himself the Black Spartacus in honor of Spartacus. Spartacus that was also the personal hero of Karl Marx, the communist philosopher from Germany, because uh, Spartacus was a worker who had stood up against the rich by Crassus. Uh, there was even a group of German communists after World War I that called themselves the Spartacus. Uh, Spartacus that was also the personal hero of the actor Kirk Douglas, who was Jewish, and who associated Spartacus with the Jews' own struggle against human bondage. Uh, so Kirk Douglas starred in the great 1950s epic Spartacus, uh, which I highly recommend you watch. It's a great movie. And then if you search through the various corners of the internet, you may encounter a gay magazine called Spartacus. Apparently there is something attractive about muscular, half-clad young men to the gay community. In other words, so little is known about Spartacus that everyone has been able to project their own fantasies onto his life. It's like a Rorschach test. So my question is, who is your Roman hero? Is it Cincinnatus? Is it Spartacus? Why? Not Caesar, I hope. I remember that he killed and enslaved my ancestors in Gaul. Well, that's it for today and for this section. Next time we'll start a whole new section on ancient religions. We'll start with the two oldest ones of the lot, Hinduism and Judaism. Goodbye. Au revoir.